Hey, how you doing, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Hockey on the Spot with Brandon Barenfeld. I'm Brandon Barenfeld, and this is episode 17 of Hockey on the Spot. Today, I'll be continuing with the 30 teams in 30 days for the entire month of August. And as of yesterday, officially done with all the Western Conference teams. Now things start to get a little more interesting as we move on to the Eastern Conference, um, which has 16 teams in it, while the West has 14. Um, so two 18 divisions rather than two 17 divisions. So we'll start off with the a tour around the Atlantic Division, um, or should I say the new Atlantic Division, as that no longer is considered the division that used to include the Devils, Islanders, Rangers, Flyers, and Penguins. Now is what was the Northeast Division, of the Bruins, Sabres, Canadians, Senators, and Maple Leafs. Now you throw in the Detroit Red Wings, but also the Florida Panthers and the Tampa Bay Lightning from the South. So, uh, d interesting name change indeed. While the other division, of uh, the old Atlantic Division, which now also includes the Columbus Blue Jackets, Carolina Hurricanes, and Washington Capitals, is now called the Metropolitan Division. So, getting back on track... Let's now start our tour around the new Atlantic Division, uh, starting with the Boston Bruins. For the Boston Bruins, very interesting year last year. They had a great, great season once again. Uh, they finished fourth place in the Eastern Conference with 62 points, one point behind the Montreal Canadiens, and that we'll get into that in a minute. Um, but that look, but they, but their overall league standings were definitely much better than their conference standings showed. They actually finished fifth in the overall league, uh, more points even than the Vancouver Canucks and the Washington Capitals, two division leaders from last year. So, very great season for the Boston Bruins. For the, for basically most of the season, they were pretty much consistent all year round up until. The Boston bombing. When the Boston bombing occurred, the team slowed down. It really took a lot out of the team. It hurt them emotionally and mentally as well, and it really diminished and it really deteriorated their gameplay. And therefore, it caused them to go three, five, and two in their last ten games. And this was a team that was en route to winning the Northeast Division. But because of how poor they poorly they did toward the end of the season, the they ended up being surpassed by the Montreal Canadiens on the last day. So, um, but however, the the shift in the change of position within the division really didn't show in the playoffs. Montreal suffered a, an early playoff exit, losing in the first round in five games to the Ottawa Senators. And as for the Boston Bruins, after a very rough start in the playoffs, winning their first game, winning their first game, but then losing their next three to the Toronto Maple Leafs, they ended up making a huge come. Actually, no. Um, after holding a three-one, they got off to a great start in the playoffs, holding a three-one series lead against the Maple Leafs. However, the Leafs then came back to tie the series and almost won Game Seven. They were up 4-1 to one in that game, but the Bruins ended up making a huge comeback and winning in overtime. And then they eased through the next two rounds, being the New York Rangers in five games after that, courtesy of young defenseman Tory Krug. And then in the Eastern Conference Finals, the biggest surprise of all, going up against a Pittsburgh Penguins team that many considered to be, by this point, an all-star team of sorts. And everybody thought the Penguins were going to dominate that series with their offense. However, the Boston Bruins, in fact, were the team that would dominate with their defense. Though the Pens did, I think, end the series with more shots on goal, the Bruins' defense shut them down and limited them to just two goals in the whole series. Sport, And that really, really was a big... That was really a big disappointment for Pittsburgh. So Boston goes all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals. In 2011, they defeated the Vancouver Canucks in seven games to win the Cup. However, this time around, not as good. They lose in six games to the to the President's Trophy winning Chicago Blackhawks. 
um, although they did hold a 2-1 to -one series lead. So, um, with all that being said and done, a lot of changes did need to be make, made. They did do a little bit of an overhaul of their roster to hopefully get themselves a little bit better. Um, <laughs> so, let's get started, shall we? It all started pretty much with a couple of long-term re-signings. Well, that's not technically where it started, but that's where I'm going to touch upon first. Um, they re they get their goaltender Tuka Rask signed up to an eight-year extension worth 56 million, um, and they also get their their franchise center Patrice Bergeron signed up long-term, eight years also, but 52 million, so four million less than Tuka Rask, but. Still a lot of money and still a great contract, but this he's basically a leader in the locker room and basically the guy they want to have as their franchise center going forward. Um, and it's a great move because he is one of the best overall players in the league. Uh, the perfect offensive and defensive blend and a pure center. So Bruins love him, Bruin fans love him, and I'm happy for the Bruins that they're keeping this guy for a while. He's going to be a great player. He is a great player. He really is. But with these contract signings, they also had a couple of departures as well. They still have three guys on the unrestricted free agent board, but all of them will not be returning. Jay pa J Pandolfo, um, who will probably retire. Kaspers Dojavins, who I believe may go to the KHL or somewhere in Europe. And Wade Redden, defenseman. Um, who they got at the trade deadline last year from the St. Louis Blues. He will not be back, um, and who knows what will happen to him. him. But then they also did have a couple of <laughs> actual departures via free agency, um, starting going from more minor to more major. Uh, right winger Jamie Tardif, who played two games last year, um, he goes over and signs with the, with the Buffalo Sabres, so nothing big there. But, however, they do lose their backup goaltender, Anton Kudobin. He signs with the Carolina Hurricanes. Um, defense, veteran defenseman Andrew Ference, who had been in their top four and was a core piece to their cup team in 2011 and a core piece to their team this year, he, he officially leaves feeling that there's nothing more he has to do in Boston. He signs with the Edmonton Oilers. That's a huge hole to fill on defense. And probably their biggest, um, and then their two biggest losses via free agency. This one more intended, one that wasn't. They lose Yaramir Yager, who they also got the trade deadline last year from the Dallas Stars. Um, they Yaramir Yager after did not really live up to the expectations in Boston after he was playing very well in Dallas. He really struggled in Boston. Did not have a goal in the playoffs. Had a, quite a few assists. But didn't have a goal. He goes over and signs with the New Jersey Devils for one year as a sign that this will probably be his last year in the National Hockey League. And then Nathan Horton, probably the biggest loss of all. Um, they lose a very valuable right winger and a key piece to that line with David Krejci and Milan Lucic. He goes and signs a long-term deal with the Columbus Blue Jackets of all places. And then they also make a trade. A pretty big trade. They probably the biggest trade this off season. Um, with but with Patrice Bergeron locked up long term, and they have David Krejci there as well. They felt no need to keep former second overall pick from 2010, Tyler Sagan, as there was really much no room for him after a great 11-12 season, a career year. He had a huge setback year last year. And rather than be the third line center in Boston, he gets traded to the Dallas Stars, where he'll be the first line center. And Rich Peverly also leaves and gets traded to the Dallas Stars, along with prospect defenseman Ryan Button, a shutdown guy. Um, I, but they did get quite a package back in that trade. They acquire higher right uh, right winger Louis Erickson from the Dallas Stars, a sniper and one of the more underrated players in the league. And though he had a rough year last year, this is a goal scorer. He's This is a goal scorer, a sniper, and a guy who is not easy to knock off the puck, even though he's not really a power forward. 
He's one of the few snipers that's not easy to knock off the puck, and he has a lot of skill, the native out of Sweden. Um, at 28 years of age, he'll probably be on the top line with Patrice Bergeron this year, um, uh, and Brad Marchand as well. So I think that's a great addition for the Boston Bruins, but they also get a couple of youngsters in that trade. A uh, couple of right-wingers in Riley Smith, and Matt Frazier, both expected to be pure goal scorers in this league. Um, I've seen both of them play in Dallas. Both of them are very good players. And one, one of them, if not both of them, will have a future with the team this year. And then the other one, if he doesn't play this year, will play next year. Um, they also get prospect defenseman Joe Morrow in that trade, who was originally sent to Dallas from the Pittsburgh Penguins in the Jerome McGinley trade. Um, but now the, he is on the Boston Bruins. So, a oh, great addition for the Boston, Boston Bruins. He has a great future as an offensive defenseman in the National Hockey League. Um, so, that was definitely the biggest trade of any team this summer. And then they did go out and make a couple of signings as well. A couple minor signings. They bring in a couple of... Johnsons, both coming over from the Phoenix Coyotes. Nick Johnson, a right winger, who is sure to add some depth when he plays. And then they also get goaltender Chad Johnson, who could, who will battle for the backup position this year. A, a young kid by the name, young goaltender Nicholas Svedberg, another kid who will battle him for that spot. Um, because it doesn't look like they will be bringing back Tim Thomas, and it doesn't look like they'll be bringing in a backup goaltender this year. And then the big, biggest signing of them all for the Boston Bruins, Jerome Aginla, coming over from the Pittsburgh Penguins. They signed him to a one-year deal. Uh, now, Jerome Aginla, definitely not the same player he used to be, um, but he is definitely still a top-six forward does always get off to a rough start in the season, and that, of course, will be an issue again this year. It always is. But once the season gets going, he's going to be great. He's going to replace Nathan Horton this season on the line with David Krejci and Milan Lucic. No question about that. But <laughs> uh, And it's really interesting to see this power forward coming here. Here last season, it looked like he was going to be traded to the Bruins. And there was a trade set up, but in last minute decided he didn't want to go there. He decided he want, he would rather go to the Pittsburgh Penguins. So he goes to the Pens. Pens meet the Bruins in the Eastern Conference Finals. Bruins kick their butts in four game, games, a sweep. And now, again, officially goes to the Bruins second time around, and he's really happy to be there. But again, a power forward, a guy who will stand up for his teammates. Uh, Ace has a grinder inside him. This guy's a lion. He basically is a lion, a future Hall of Famer. Um, and, and yes, this when he is on his game, this is a sniper also. So great wrist shot as well. So great signing by the Boston Bruins, in my opinion. Um, so their team is pretty much set for this year. They're going to have a couple of... The only thing is they'll have the, a couple of youngsters coming up this year. Um, Riley Smith is sure to be one of them. Um, but then there's that other youngster that could play as well. There's, they got Jordan Karen still in their system, a former first round pick. He could play. Matt Frazier could play. Carl Soderberg is probably the most likely candidate, but on a new look third line, but you never know what'll happen. You really never know what'll happen. Ryan Spooner and Jared Knight also, um, both candidates, um, for that third line. And that's really the big question. What, who, what youngsters are going to play on the third line with Chris Kelly at center? With their fourth line pretty much set. Their first, second, and fourth line pretty much set. Um, and uh, their defense core pretty much set. Matt Barkowski is probably going to be the seventh guy on defense. While Tory Krug and Dougie Hamilton play main signature roles. Uh, they still got Adam McQuaid. They still got Johnny Boychuk. They still got Dennis Seidenberg. And of course, they still got the big man, Zdeno Chara, their captain. And then the goaltenders, Tuka Rask, and of course, 
the battle of backup goaltender will be determined between Chad Johnson, who they got from the Phoenix Coyotes, and Nicholas Svedberg. So that's really the biggest question for the Bruins. Who is going to play on the line with Chris Kelly? I There's no question. It seems pretty definite that Riley Smith's going to play, but then there's that other spot, as I mentioned. So, And then the other big question for the Bruins, can their power play get on track? That's one of the reasons they went out and got Louis Erickson. This is a power play specialist, um, and this is a guy who definitely can pro produce a lot of shots on goal. So I, I like this addition a lot. I think it's going to help the Bruins offensively, but they are mostly a defensive team. Everybody knows it. So um, it's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out when the season begins. This is definitely the most active they've been with their roster in a very long time. So, Okay, now let's take a look at the prospects for the Boston Bruins. Um, for the Bruins, a very, very deep prospect pool. pool. They have Malcolm Subban, a goaltender, as their number one prospect. However, he needs more development. Joe Morrow is number two. Alexander Koklachev, who... They're actually very lucky to still have. He would have been one of the guys going over to the Calgary Flames if they had gotten Jerome McGinley. But he is their number three prospect. Ryan Spooner, number four. Nicholas Spedberg, number five. Jared Knight's on there. They got every, maybe pretty much every player on this pros, in this prospect pool is well known. However, the one prospect on this list that really catches my eye, and it's really no question that he would catch anybody's eye, pro the number six prospect, defenseman Tory Krug. This kid is going to be something special. He's an undrafted 22-year-old coming out of college. He's only five foot nine and 180 pounds, so very small for defenseman. However, he came up last year <laughs> for the... Um, Boston Bruins in the second round, round of the playoffs against the New York Rangers, and no question he was the best player in that series. He was the reason the Rangers got out as quickly as they did, um, and this kid is going to be something special. He's got a great career ahead of him, has the potential for a 12-year career or more, um, and he is an offensive defenseman, a big shot from the point despite the size. And he is going to be a power play quarterback for this team as well. So what's not to like about Tory Krug and what's not to respect about him? And why wouldn't I pick him as my top prospect? Now, for the Boston Bruins to be successful this season, the player on this roster, in my mind, that has to be good for the Bruins to be successful this season, no question whatsoever, has to be Jerome Aginla. Again, they get Jerome Aginla in the um, it, it, this offseason. They sign him to a one-year deal. But he's in his 30s. He's 35 years of age plus. Um, so um, 36 years of age. But he, and again, he is not the same player. Last season in 44 games, only 14 goals and 33 points. Not Jerome McGinley like numbers at all, which tells you his age is starting to show. So if he's if the Bruins are going to be back in the Stanley Cup Finals this year, he has to look like a player determined to win the Stanley Cup. Overall, are the Boston Bruins a playoff team? No question about it. This team is absolutely stacked up front, um, and even with the youngsters coming in, and on defense, they're rock solid as well, despite the loss of Andrew Ferentz, which... No, they'll have no problem replacing with a guy like Dougie Hamilton and maybe guys like Johnny Boychuk and Adam McQuaid play bigger roles this season, particularly Johnny Boychuk. So this is a playoff team, and Tuka Rask, I think, is a very reliable goalie. That is another question. Can he prove that that wasn't a one-year thing? I think he will. He's a very good goalie, former first-round pick, so the Bruins are pretty much set. They are a playoff team. All right, guys, that'll do it for episode 17 of Hockey on the Spot. Join me again tomorrow when we talk about the Buffalo Sabres. So until then, this has been Hockey on the Spot with Brandon Barenfeld. I'm Brandon Barenfeld, so join me again tomorrow. Thank Thanks a lot, guys, and have a great day.